Hello there, I'm Kalapli Tar from the University of Illinois, and it's wonderful to be here with you for Big Data Week. We've witnessed an incredible revolution over the last few decades. The notion of every computer, every phone, heck, even the modern toaster, being able to communicate with every other device in Earth in real time is just stunning. I can be walking down the street, have a question about a particular term and when it first showed up in books, pull up my phone, type in that term, and view a graph in real time to to see every ebb and flow of that term's use over the last 200 years without missing a step while walking down the street. Trillions of words at my fingertips in real time anywhere on earth. There are over 340 million new tweets every day. The entire New York Times over the last half century printed just 2.9 billion words compared with more than 8 billion words posted to Twitter every single day. That's right, if you missed that. There are more than twice as many words posted to Twitter every single day as were in the entire New York Times over the last half century. Facebook, 250 million new photos every day. That's a quarter billion and 2.7 billion likes every single day. Over 845 million user, active users, more than 100, 100 billion connections between them. More than half of all North Americans are on Facebook. Let's look at Google Books. Thus far, they have managed to digitize somewhere around 4% of every book ever published, weighing in at around 2 trillion words. If we do the math, that works out to somewhere around 50 trillion words in every book published over the last half millennia. At its current growth rate, Twitter will reach that many words just three years from now. That's right, in less than a decade, the, Twitter will have captured more than all the printed works of all the printed words of all the printed works in the last half millennia. Companies like ProQuest, Redex, Google, and countless others are racing to digitize the historical past, while in the present, every action we take is captured in digital trail. If you think about the fact that there's a quarter billion photographs uploaded to Facebook every day, that's pretty mind-boggling. For most of history, only major figures, major public figures, left a significant permanent historical trace. With the rise of smartphones today, people are chronicling their entire lives in the most nuanced detail. A college student, when they graduate, might have thousands of photographs of every event, every party, they ever went to in their entire life. But what gets more exciting is all the literature that's coming out telling us what can be done and how powerful and representative big data analysis of media really is. In the last few years, papers come, have come out that have shown the tone of Twitter predicts the stock market, Twitter tone per, towards political candidates, matches opinion polls, and even how overall Twitter tone matches circadian rhythms of global society. Social media in particular is tremendously exciting. 200 years ago, you might wait days to learn about something that happened on the other side of the country. A hundred years ago, you had to wait till the following morning to read about in your paper. Thirty years ago, you'd see it hours later on TV. But today, you can chart an earthquake spread, literally, by watching geocoded tweets light up almost in real time as the earthquake moves across the country. It's just incredible. Reaction to major events of the moment pour in within minutes today, from Bangladesh to Buenos Aires, offering unparalleled visibility in the heartbeat of global society. Moreover, the constant stream of, of daily life that flows across social media platforms provides rich contextual background information on the narratives of each region and culture. Social media has become one of the primary organizing tools for rebel and opposition movements around the world, offering the earliest indicators into emerging unrest, often transitioning over time to become the opposition movement's official communication stream. The notion of authority and the ability of information to impact have changed dramatically in the social era. A single post by a single individual can go viral and reach millions, hundreds of millions, within hours or days and ultimately topple a government regardless of whether that information is true or not. Thus, more than ever, media stream and the public information environments matter much more than the factual environment. We often hear the hard sciences are the big data centers of the universe, that astrophysics or genomics researchers are the ones with the biggest data problems. But in the emerging data universe of the internet, they become the small data folks. Some of the largest scientific projects coming online later this decade would generate 10 to 20 terabytes a day. Google was processing uh, was 24 petabytes in 2007. And it gets worse. In the hard sciences, it's considered normal for a scientist to submit a job to a supercomputer and wait days, hours, or days to get a result back. No matter how complex the query, in the web world, if it takes more than 30 seconds for a result, no web user is going to wait for that. So not only do we have to deal with orders of magnitude larger data sets that grow exponentially faster, and we have to be able to analyze them and return results faster than a traditional scientist takes to hit the enter key to wait for a day-long result.
We're reaching a point now where we have the algorithms, the analysis methods, the computing power to, and there's a near arms race from companies now to provide new data streams to us. And internet access is st slowly reaching the furthest points of the earth. In the not too distant future, every man, woman, and child on earth will be interconnected. What can we do with all this data? In the social sciences and humanities, this is enabling a new era of research known as quantitative qualitative analysis, in which we focus on finding new ways of quantifying the latent aspects of text and language. Historically, we would extract facts from information, for, you know, for example, uh, lists of riots from the news. But what's more interesting are the, are the latent dimensions. You know, what, what's the emotion behind that? And historically, that was discarded as being incomputable. But as we all know, dimensions like tone have become booming industries now, with large companies performing extensive brand mining. My own research focuses on the incredible potential of all this data to help us understand the global pulse of human society. A recent paper of mine titled Culturomics 2.0, Forecasting Large-Scale Human Behavior Using Global News Media Tone in Time and Space, used an archive of more than 100 million news articles from almost every country on Earth, covering a quarter century of human society. From this, more than 10 billion people, places, and things, connected by over 100 trillion relationships, were extracted into a vast 2.4 petabyte network. Now imagine every one of these connections carries with it more than 2,000 emotional indicators, capturing everything from tone to, fear for, to optimism, fear for the future, self-reliance, and any number of other emotional undertones. Going a step further, every one of these connections is encased in space and time, allowing the chart how every pair of cities on Earth have conflicted or cooperated over history. What can you do with a network like this? Well, I toss it into a huge silicon graphic supercomputer with four terabytes of memory and run algorithms that look for interesting patterns in the data. Of course, the network was too large for any academically available computing system, something we're all familiar with. So I built special algorithms to look at the data piecemeal, like a flashlight in a dark room. And that's actually a fascinating aspect of the big data world, is that really most of the data we work with is too large to look at at one piece. So we break it up and look at it piecemeal. But the problem is if you zoom out to see the big picture, you miss the nuance that's important. But if you zoom in to see that nuance, you miss the big picture. So a big part of big data is finding the right, hitting that right balance. That's one of the key challenges we focus on. In my case, one of the first findings was that the tone of all coverage about a country gives you really key insights into its stability. In other words, take all the news coverage around the world, every radio broadcast, every TV broadcast, every newspaper article, magazine article, scoop it all up worldwide and, uh, and look at everything said in a given month about a country. So take Egypt. Look at everything said around Around the world about Egypt each month, measure the aggregate tone of that over time, and plot that. What you get, in essence, is sort of a global consensus view uh, of how positive or negative the world views that country at the moment. Now, if you plot this and, and the tone is stable, the country tends to be stable. But if you see tone start plunging quickly, that country likely will end up collapsing. Now, I call it conflict forecasting, not prediction, because you can't say that you know the president of country X is leaving at 5:04 next Friday. Uh, but what you can see is that that leader has lost global legitimacy, or that country has passed a critical turning point. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a lot like a weather forecast. If the forecast has 80% chance of rain tomorrow, it may be a sunny day, but it's worth bringing an umbrella because more times than not, it probably does end up raining. Now, why does all this work? If you think about the London riots last August, it wasn't that everyone was in utopia and woke up one day and said, let's riot. It was because people's pent up frustrations kept building and building until they, they, they had no choice. It, just, it, it eventually erupted from for a transition from verbal expression to physical violence. News and social media are just samples of a global consciousness, but they give us our best approximation of the global pulse, allowing us to measure latent unrest bubbling to the surface and look for changes in that that might single impending physical unrest. It turns out there's a precedence for this. The first analysis report from the nascent World War II U.S. News Monitoring Service included this quote, Japanese radio intensifies still further its defiant hostile tone. In contrast to its behavior during earlier periods of Pacific tension, Radio Tokyo makes no peace appeals. Comment in the United States is bitter and increased. Now, this was published the day before Pearl Harbor. So there's a long history in measuring global tone to understand so, social unrest. And, to, and today in the economic space, we're seeing a long, a rapidly growing literature on how powerful big data analysis is of the social world and how, it can be, and how powerful it can be in forecasting future economic behavior. I think this is one of the most exciting aspects of big data. It, it's giving us an unprecedented view in the global society. For the first time in our history, we can literally peer into the global consciousness.
and view in near real time as the world goes about its daily activities or reacts to emerging situations. Every day brings new innovations, new data sets, new algorithms, new computer systems, new ideas. And it's clear that the future is incredibly bright for big data and all the amazing new understandings of the world that are yet to come. So thank you so much again for having me, and I hope you share my enthusiasm of the future of big data.